Amen. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 11 for our study this evening. Back in the days when the telegraph was the fastest method of long distance communication, a young man applied for a job as a Morse code operator. Answering an ad in the local newspaper, he went to the office address listed, and when he arrived, he entered a large, busy office filled with all kinds of noise, all kinds of clatter, including the sound of a telegraph in the background. A sign on the receptionist counter read that the job applicants were to fill out a form and then wait in their seat until they were summoned into the office for um, an interview. Well, the young man filled out his form, sat down with seven other applicants in the waiting area. After a few minutes, though, the young man got up, walked across the room to the door of the inner office, and just walked right in. Well, naturally, the other applicants were very curious about that bizarre conduct, thinking that the young man made a mistake by going into the office unsummoned, and that he would quickly be disqualified from the job. When, in fact, a few moments later, the employer stepped out of the office, escorting the young man out, saying to the other applicants, Gentlemen, thank you very much for coming in, but the job has just been filled. Well, the other applicants began grumbling. They didn't understand what was going on. When one spoke up and said, Hey, wait a minute, I don't understand. He was the last one to come in. We never got a chance to be interviewed, yet he gets the job? And that's not fair. The employer said, I'm sorry, but all the time that you've been sitting here, that telegraph in the background, it's been ticking out the following message in Morse code. If you understand this message, then come right in. The job is yours. None of you heard it or understood it. This young man did. That's why the job is his. You see, it would seem that Ezekiel was like that young man in that he was the only one that understood the message. He was the only one tuned in to God, getting it, if you will, as God was speaking through the prophet here to his people in a very dark, dismal time in Israel's history. For you will recall that Ezekiel finds himself ministering to the people of God while they are in captivity, prisoners of war, if you will, in Babylon. And yet while Ezekiel is there in Babylon with them, ministering to them, we saw last time how he was caught up in a vision of God. A vision that took Ezekiel back to Jerusalem. Back to where they had been deported from because, well, God was going to give Ezekiel some insights into the spiritual condition, into the decay that was going on in the beloved city. And that vision continues now as we pick up in verse 1 of chapter 11 where we read, Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faces eastward, and there at the door of the gate were twenty-five men, among whom I saw Jazaniah the son of Azur, and Pelatiah the son of Beniah, princes of the people. And he said to me, Son of man, these are the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in this city, who say the time is not near to build houses. This city is the cauldron and we are the meat. And we'll talk more about what that means in the next set of verses. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy, O son of man. And so Ezekiel again, caught up in this heavenly vision, taken to the east gate of the temple, if you will, where he sees these 25 men, quite possibly the same 25 men that we saw back in chapter 8 that were sitting in his front room. They were having tea, if you will. They were hanging out, fellowshipping, visiting when this whole vision began. Began. And I can't help but think that God was giving Ezekiel some spiritual insight into the very company in his presence. You understand what I'm saying? As he was sitting there with these 25 men, now the Lord is beginning to show Zeke some of the things about these men. And we see from these verses how these were the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel, verse 2 tells us, in the city. 
In other words, it was these guys that as the Babylonians were coming to conquer, as God was saying, don't resist, go with them, because if you don't, you're going to die. Surrender, go away captive. These were men who were saying, oh no, we will never lose the beloved city. We will never lay down our weapons. We will never surrender. And so they were offering up false counsel. They were misguiding the people. When Ezekiel here is told to speak against them, to prophesy against them, verse 4 says, and so he does, beginning in verse 5. And the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me and said to me, Speak, thus says the Lord. Thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know, catch this, for I know the things that come into your mind. We'll talk about that more in a moment. You have multiplied your slain in this city. And you have filled its streets with the slain. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, your slain, whom you have laid in its midst, they are the meat, and this city is the cauldron, but I shall bring you out of the midst of it. You have feared the sword, and I will bring a sword against you, says the Lord God. And I will bring you out of its midst, and deliver you into the hands of strangers, and execute judgments on you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. This city, catch this, shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in its midst. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. For you have not walked in my statutes, nor executed my judgments, but have done according to the customs of the Gentiles, which are all around you. Now, now, now we see first of all here in verse 5 how God knows what they're thinking. Do you catch that there? He says, for I know the things that come into your mind. Well, that's an awesome thought, friends. To realize that God not only sees what we do, but he knows what we think. Whoa. In fact, he knows why we do what we do. He knows the hidden motives of our hearts. He knows the things that are going on in your mind right now. Some of you are saying, man, I wish this guy would hurry up. You know, my favorite TV show starts in 30 minutes. Or some of you are planning the weekend outing or thinking ahead to the 4th of July weekend. And, you know, I mean, it's incredible. I've, I've, I've often come into this place wondering, Lord, what would it be like if you were to suddenly flash my mind on the PowerPoint? Ooh, cobwebs, you know, all that kind of stuff. Who knows? I mean, what would it possibly be like? But God knows what we think. In fact, I sometimes don't wonder if he doesn't know what we think before we thunk it. Huh? He knows what these guys are thinking. They're thinking that, hey, we're just going to hang out in the city, man. We're like the meat. The city's like the cauldron, which means like, just like the cauldron protects the meat from the fire, you know, the city's going to protect us from the marauding Babylonians. We're safe, guys. Just hunker down, hang out, don't surrender. And God is saying, I know you're thinking that. You're wrong. You're wrong. You think you're going to be spared the sword when in fact the sword is going to devour you. Because he goes on to say here in verse um, 10, actually verse 11, This city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in its midst. I will judge you at the border of Israel. In other words, you're not going to be protected. You're not going to be safe. You can run, but you can't hide. Because when the judgments of God come, <laughs> they will find you. Yeah, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I was saved back in the 70s. And I remember in the 80s, there was a lot of hype about Jesus coming in the 80s. Those of you that have been a Christian for any length of time, you remember that. I mean, I we started attending Calvary Chapel, West Covina in 1978. Um, the big hoopla was that Israel, a biblical generation, was 40 years, being founded in 1948. Uh, the end of that generation would be 1988, minus seven years for the tribulation period. means that, hey, buckle your seatbelt, baby. We're going home. And 1981. At least that's what we were thinking. You know, and there was a lot of excitement. There was a lot of enthusiasm thinking, man, the Lord is coming. We're out of here. And, and, and as we are, are thinking about that, and as, as we're excited about that prospect, we remember how judgment was going to come. 
the tribulation was going to fall. And, and people were thinking, well, you know, it's okay. I, I won't accept the Lord until you guys are raptured out of here. And then I'll come to Jesus, you know. And when you read the account of Revelation, the apocalypse, and some of the other parallel in the Old Testament, and realize the incredible judgment that's going to happen. Uh, maybe you saw some of the movies that were very popular in that era that were kind of the survivalist ideas, you know. It's like, we're going to hide out from the Antichrist. We're going to store our food. We're going to store our water. We're going to have our guns, you know. We'll be protected. And yet I'm reminded even as we see here that there is nothing that can protect you from the judgment of God. It was back in those days that Greg Laurie asked a very persuasive question at his crusades. These people who would think that they'd just wait until the church was raptured and then they would come to Jesus and oh, if they had to lay down their life to follow the Lord, well, hey, they will, knowing that, man, this, this is true. This Christianity stuff is real. And I remember Greg asking the question, what makes you think that you will die for Jesus then if you can't live for Jesus now? And that's a compelling thought. You're only kidding yourself. If you think that you would be willing to lay down your life during that tribulation period, during that day of judgment, during that day of persecution, and, and, and all kinds of terror, if you can't freely live for Him now in this time of the Spirit working and the grace of God being poured out, don't kid yourself even as these people were kidding themselves. God says, the city will afford you no protection. The city will not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in its midst. I will judge you at the border of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Note this now, for you have not walked in my statutes, nor executed my judgments, but have done according to the customs of the Gentiles which are all around you. In other words, Israel, people called by my name. You've become just like those pagan, heathen, sinful Gentiles around you. In other words, you're no different. You're no different than the non-believer. That's a strong word to the church tonight, friend. Because as we have been studying in our New Testament on Sunday morning, we've noted throughout several chapters and verses of the New Testament books how we are to be distinct. We are to be different. There is to be something about a Christian that is visibly different from the rest of the non-believing world. And if it's not happening like that in our life, then something is wrong. Jesus put it this way over in the Sermon on the Mount when he said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its flavor how shall it be seasoned it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot oh really do we need another battery underfoot by men yep I would say that light suggests we need another battery <laughs> thank you I'm losing my charge. Thanks, Gilbert. Ah, let there be sound. And so we see how they had become just like the people around them. They were no longer the salt. They were no longer the light. They were no longer distinctive, but they just kind of blended in with everybody else around them. And when the people of God become like that, that's when the judgment of God falls. And we saw last time in our study how it begins where? At the house of God. Began in the Lord's sanctuary. Get this, verse 13. Now it happened. Here's Ezekiel, man, prophesying. Laying this heavy trip on the people of God, man. When right in the middle of this vision and this prophesying... He says, now it happened. While I was prophesying, the Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. Get that, died. And then I fell on my face and cried with a loud voice and said, Oh, Lord God, will you make a complete end of the remnant of Israel? Now listen, folks, this had to be dramatic. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, I've had people fall asleep in my services. It's kind of fun being up in the front. I kind of watch the elbows in motion there every now and then to kind of wake the neighbor. I've heard people snore. 
You know, I've watched people, you know, it's fun, you know, we sing songs here and we kind of close our eyes to worship the Lord. Some of you are closing your eyes to really get a short nap, one of those power naps. I know. I know because I do it too sometimes, you know. Just because I'm up front here on Sunday and Thursday doesn't mean that I don't sit where you sit on other occasions throughout the year. And i got to tell you, I know what it's like, man. In a couple of weeks we'll be at the worship conference in Oceanside, and I know as we sit through some of those sessions, especially the ones after lunch, that's when they really need to put the captivating, humorous speakers up because, man, that's when you are really wanting to zone out, isn't it, right after a good, filling lunch? But it's kind of amusing. I've watched people, you know, their heads bob and knock. Yeah, I've watched drool, you know. All, I mean, but I've never had something like this happen. I mean, that would be a real attention getter, wouldn't you agree? Kind of like what happened in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, here, Petey, we're bringing this offering to God. You know, we sold this piece of land and we're bringing the whole enchilada to give to the Lord. When Peter looks at Ananias and says, Man, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to God? You, well, it was still yours. It was yours to keep, but you're lying to the Holy Spirit. And no sooner did Peter confront Ananias, and you know the story, boom, down for the count, out he went. And we're told that no sooner had the people, had the men carried his corpse out of the, out of the room, when his Mrs. Ananias shows up, Sapphira, and Peter asks her the same question, and they had obviously gotten their story together, because she pulled the same blunder, repeated the story, and ended up being stricken dead as well. Now, do you think that had some kind of purifying effect in the church? Do you think the church kind of got the message that, hey, don't give to God if you're not giving with the right motive? Don't say to God, here's my all, when you're holding a little bit back. Don't try to pull the wool over Dad's eyes thinking he doesn't see, he doesn't know. From cover to cover, this book tells us that God sees and knows. And we are only kidding ourselves to think differently. This guy dies, and Ezekiel's like, whoa, God, are you going to wipe them all out? I mean, last time we saw how he was thinking he was the only one left. He's thinking, that's it, man. Even the remnant is toast. History. We read on in verse 14. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, your brethren, your relatives, your countrymen, and all the house of Israel in its entirety are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get far away from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God. Catch this, this is incredible. Although I have cast them far off among the Gentiles, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I will, I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Oh, doesn't that just melt your heart? I mean, this is the Father heart of God for His people. This is the Lord saying, you did wrong. You're going to the woodshed. You're going to get a spanking. It's going to be bad. But I'll be with you. I'm convinced that that is the only thing that kept these people from being totally annihilated. But even when God judges, we see how He is still there. And he tells his people, though you're going into foreign land, a place that you don't understand the language, you don't know the culture, the customs, I'll be a little sanctuary for you. And we've seen the Lord do that before for his people. I can't help but think that that was the whole thing behind the pillar of fire in the cloud. Remember in, in the wilderness wandering of Israel? It was God proving himself to be a sanctuary for these people. A cloud by day. Well, hey, that's kind of important. Wouldn't you agree when you're wandering in the wilderness? Wouldn't you want a cloud by day? Hey, isn't it refreshing out there tonight? Because while Phoenix is nice and toasty and, and, and unfortunately burning up, <laughs> may not be a bad thing for Phoenix, um, up here the clouds move in, the storms come, and it cools off, and it's just wonderful. Something refreshing about that cloud. And God was that cloud for his people by day. He was that pillar of fire. He was that navigational aid, if you will, by night. He was 
that sanctuary. And friend, he's our sanctuary. He's your sanctuary and mine. He's the one that I can run to when I have an owie. He's the one I can cry to when life isn't fair. He's the one I can lean on when I need strength and support. He's my everything because he is my strong tower, my rock, my refuge. And here he tells us he's our sanctuary. Whoa. Therefore say, verse 17 continues, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered. And I will give you the land of Israel. Hey, folks, that settles the dispute between the Palestinians and the Jews over who's entitled to the land. Over and over again, God says, I will give you the land. From the very beginning with Abraham all the way through to the very end, we see how the land rightly belongs to Israel. I am concerned about our country's policies and occasional pressuring of Israel. Condoleezza Rice was just over in the region last week trying to broker more negotiations between the Palestinians and the Jews and I'm concerned that we sometimes as a country find ourselves acting contrary, politically speaking, to the scriptures. And I hope you understand, and the Israelis well know this, that no matter how much land they give up to the Palestinians, there will be no peace in the land. I've shared my experiences in visiting with, with Jews on flights to Tel Aviv, on flights to Israel, and only the Western world is kidding itself to think that we're going to broker a peace in the Middle East. They have been fighting with each other since the days of, of, of Jacob and Esau. I mean, that was the origin of the conflict and throughout human history, even as we see in the Old Testament scriptures here, it is played out in one episode after another. And don't think that it's going to stop even in our lifetime. The only thing that's going to bring, bring a stop, the only thing that's going to bring peace to that land, as we've shared before, is the Prince of Peace. Did we die again? Oh my goodness. We need to get some more batteries. I'll just talk louder. Or actually, you know what? No, I got a battery up here. Yikes. Station break. Here, I got one. Okay. Oh, boy. That really works. And so we see the promise of God to bring these people back into the land. But, but, but notice this. As he goes on in verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 17, he says, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered. I will give you the land of Israel and they will go there and they will take away all its detestable things and all its abominations from there. And I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts follow the desire for their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. The glorious promise of God regathering his people and reestablishing them in the land. Now listen, folks. While it was true that the Lord brought them back into the land after the Babylonian captivity, I believe that we are living in the days that are actually seeing the fulfillment of this prophecy. There still hasn't been a change of heart in the Jew. You will remember that John tells us that Jesus came into his own and his own received him not. They rejected him. Not only did they reject him, but there before Pontius Pilate they said crucify him. Crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our children. And I don't think they realized the weight, the gravity of what they were saying there. Because I think that has had some far reaching ramifications. Even up to the days of World War II and the six million that were slaughtered in the Holocaust of Hitler. And even up into our own days where we continue to see. Jew and Palestinian Arab and Israel's battling and conflicting against one another. 
there's coming a day, it hasn't happened yet, I don't believe, that God is going to put a new spirit and take their stony heart out and give them a heart of flesh. A heart transplant, if you will. Taking that hard, cold heart out and giving them a tender, open heart that will receive from the ministry of the Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I think from time to time, we as Christians could use a good heart transplant. We hear a lot about heart health these days. You know, keeping your cholesterol low and, and proper diet and the, the good things you can eat, keep a healthy heart and everything. But how about spiritually? You know, sometimes our heart, spiritually speaking, can become like theirs. It can become cold. It can become hard. We can develop a hard heart because, well, maybe life hasn't been fair. We can develop a hard heart because maybe of a failed relationship or ailing health condition or something. We can develop a hard heart by just going through the religious motions and rituals. I think that there are times as Christians how we need to ask God to give us that tender heart, that heart of flesh, that heart that will be open to His Spirit. So the cherubim, verse 22, continues, lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them, and the glory of the Lord went up, note this, from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. And then the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to those in captivity, and the vision that I had seen went up from me. And so I spoke to those in captivity of all the things that the Lord has shown me. And notice as the vision begins to conclude, the last thing that Ezekiel sees here, he sees the glory of God going up from the city. He sees it as it stood on the mountain, which is on the east side of the city, which if you've been there, you know that mountain. That's the Mount of Olives. It's the same mountain that as Jesus was approaching Jerusalem, he paused, he stopped, remember? And he wept. He wept. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who killest the prophets. If you had only known the things that God was wanting to do for you in this thy day. They didn't. They didn't know. They didn't get it. And I pray as children of God that we get it. Because we go on now in the opening verses of chapter 12. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house, which has eyes to see but does not see, and ears to hear but does not hear. For they are a rebellious house. Now, now, who's God talking about here? Is he talking about those pagan, heathen sinners out there? He's talking about the people of God. That's a pretty solemn indictment when he says they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. And I wonder... How would God describe us today? Are we any different? I, I, I wonder sometimes, you've heard me share my heart on this subject where I think, you know, we have this giant electromagnetic eraser over the front door that, you know, just wipes out all of our thoughts and our remembrances of the world as we walk in here so that we can sit in the presence of the Lord and worship and receive His ministry. But then as we walk back out those doors, you know, just clears our mind and, and we forget all about it we see but we have eyes but we don't see we have ears but we don't hear I think of the thousands upon thousands of people millions of people every week who walk through the doorway of some church in our country our nation claims to be a Christian nation the latest statistics are somewhere in the 70 to 80 percentile of Americans who claim to be Christians and yet when I look at the things that we accept, 
tolerate, even embrace, I wonder if we really see, if we really hear, if we really get it. I've been in places where people get it, where God's people get it, where the Spirit of God is moving and at work. They're on fire, they're passionate, they're committed. It isn't come and go as sometimes happens in our land. It's interesting, Jesus would quote these verses over in Matthew chapter 13. And in verse 13, when he began speaking in parables to the people, you remember the story? He was teaching the people and they weren't getting it. And so the prophet Isaiah, I'm sorry, the prophet Ezekiel is quoted there as Jesus turns to teaching in parables. He begins telling stories. Because I don't know about you, but I have found that everybody loves a story. You know, I can be giving you all of the theological ramifications and insights into deep things of the scripture. And probably you will walk out of here saying, what did he say? But if I give you a simple story that illustrates what the Word of God is trying to say, you won't believe the number of people that come up to me during the week and say, Pastor, I got it. I got it because of the story you told. There's something about hearing a story that click, it just rings true with us. It, it, it brings it home. We understand. And so, Ezekiel is going to act out a story in these next verses. Watch and see. This is incredible. Therefore, son of man, prepare your belongings for captivity and go into captivity by day in their sight. You shall go from your place into captivity to another place in their sight. It may be that they will consider though they are a rebellious house. By day you shall bring out your belongings in their sight as though going into captivity and at evening you shall go in their sight like those who go into captivity. Catch this. Don't go out through your front door, Ezekiel, but dig through the wall in their sight and carry your belongings out through it. I, I think that would probably be a spectacle to see. In their sight you shall bear them on your shoulder and carry them out at twilight. You shall cover your face so that you cannot see the ground for I have made you a sign to the house of Israel. In other words, God is, is having Ezekiel as he's had him do before. Remember, this is the guy that was told to lay on one side for so many days and to lay on another side for so many days and to cook his food by cow dung and all of that incredible stuff. I mean, time and again, he's had Ezekiel play out a sermon, if you will. A visual aid, an illustration of sorts of what God is trying to communicate to his people here. And so he says, Ezekiel... I want you to round up all your belongings. I want you to beat feet out of your house. But you're not going to go out by the door. You're going to dig a hole through the wall. Now, I can tell you that probably got some neighbors' interest. You know, they're watching Ezekiel think, it's kind of like watching Noah build the ark out in the middle of, of the desert where there's never been a body of water, where there's never been any rain. Rain? What's rain, Noah? What are you talking about? A boat? What's a boat? You mean this thing floats? What's floating? We don't get the concept, you know? Can you explain it to us? But I mean, here is Ezekiel doing this incredible stuff. I, I'm sure it was quite the attention getter. When we read in verse 6 how he is assigned to the house of Israel. So, I did as I was commanded. We read in verse 7 there. I brought out my belongings by day as though going into captivity. And at evening I dug through the wall with my hand. I brought them out at twilight and I bore them on my shoulder in their sight. Ezekiel did what God asked. But he wasn't really sure what it was all about. When we read in the next verse, and in the morning the word of the Lord came to me. Now listen, folks, this is this is precious. Ezekiel obeyed the Lord, even though he didn't understand what this was about. He obeyed, and then he understood. You hearing me? Because sometimes there are going to be things that God asks of your life. 
There are going to be things that God will ask you to do that are going to make absolutely no sense whatsoever to you. It's like, God, you got the wrong number. Did you make a mistake? What are you talking about? I don't get it, Lord. I had one of those experiences about 23, 24 years ago. Working for the police department there in Southern California. K-9 unit supervisor. I was going places, man. Had a nice little home nestled in a bedroom community in the San Gabriel Mountains. We were serving the Lord together at Calvary Chapel, West Covina, when God says, Quit your job and move to Arizona. What? Quit your job and move to Arizona. Now you got to understand that I thought Arizona was nothing more than cactus, tumbleweeds, and cowboys. I mean, this was the backwoods of America to me. I mean, I mean, we've heard of the, the folks in the Appalachian Mountains and some of those really primitive folk. Uh, that was my vision of Arizona. I had no idea until we got here The places like Sholo, Pine Top, and Lakeside existed. You know, the first place we moved to was Winslow, which if you've ever been to Winslow, cactus, tumbleweeds, and cowboys fits the bill. And I'm like, God, what are you doing? This doesn't make any sense. And for several years up there, we toiled and labored and watched the church start. And, you know, I'm just beginning to get an idea of what God is up to. It's taken me 23, 24 years to finally get the picture, but it's like with Ezekiel, sometimes God will call you, ask you to do something, and you just got to do it, man. You do it by faith, you don't have a clue what it amounts to, what it's about, and at some point later on, maybe, just maybe, the Lord will make it clear to you. There may be some things in our lives that will never be clear this side of eternity, you hear me? Some things that he will ask of us, that he will expect from us, that just won't become clear until we're there. And we get the full picture. But here's Ezekiel, man, doing this stuff. And, and you got to know, it, it definitely had to attract the attention of the neighborhood. Have you ever had anybody move into the neighborhood? Oh, we all have. You see the big old truck pull up, you know, and you're all like, ooh, 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 you know. There's a house that's across the street from ours. The house is about six years old, and it's going through its fourth owner. I mean, the longest anybody's lived in that house was two years. The shortest anybody's lived in that house was two months. And I'm like, what's wrong with that? It's a brand new house. And yet, it's interesting, it's like, Alicia and I were out taking a walk around the neighborhood the other day, and I'm like, let's see how long this guy stays here, you know? But there's something about people moving in, people moving out that gets your interest, and that's what Ezekiel's doing here. He's trying to get these people's attention because the Lord has a message for them, and this is it, verse 9. Well, actually, verse 8, in the morning the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man... Has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, what are you doing? Yeah, they're watching in curiosity. They're wondering, what are you doing, Ezekiel? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, this burden concerns the prince in Jerusalem and all the house of Israel who are among them. Say, I am assigned to you. As I have done, so, it shall, so shall it be done to them. They shall be carried away into captivity. And the prince who is among them shall bear his belongings on his shoulder at twilight and go out. They shall dig through the wall to carry uh, them through, carry them out through it. And he shall cover his face so that he cannot see the ground with his eyes. I will spread my net over him, and he shall be caught in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. I will scatter to every wind all who are around him to help him and all his troops, and I will draw out the sword after them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord when I scatter them among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. But I will spare a few of their men from the sword, from famine, from pestilence, 
that they may declare all their abominations among the Gentiles wherever they go, then they shall know that I am the Lord. So this whole performance that God has Ezekiel go through here, this whole illustration, if you will, we see is a message to really one person. You see it there in verse 10? This burden concerns the prince in Jerusalem. The one who was ruling in Jerusalem at the time the Babylonians were coming. Do you remember who that was? Because we talked about him in our story of Jeremiah, in our study of Jeremiah. He was a guy named Zedekiah. Remember Zedekiah? Zedekiah thought, man, he's going to run for the hills. The Babylonians are conquering. The city's going down. He, like Ezekiel illustrated, dug a hole through the wall of the city and with all of his goods began to head for the plains, head for the hills. When ultimately Nebuchadnezzar's army caught him. And you remember the story. True to what we read here, he shall not see it, but he will die there. You see, that was an issue that created some contention between the prophets. The people were saying, well, well, how can we believe Jeremiah? How can we believe he's... He, he, one says that he's, he's, he's going there and he's going to die there. The other one says he's not even going to see Babylon. What are we, what, what's he talking about? How can he not see Babylon, yet he's going to die there? It didn't make sense to them. Until you know the story what happened. Zedekiah's sons were killed right before his eyes. And then Nebuchadnezzar put his eyes out and carted him to Babylon as a captive. He didn't see Babylon, but he would die there. And here's what's incredible. God is predicting all of that before it ever happens right here in these verses. It's like God is using Ezekiel to say, this is exactly what's going to happen to Zedekiah. You are forewarned. You've been put on notice. You have been made aware. God can do that because he sees the end from the beginning. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying in verse 17, Son of man, eat your bread with quaking and drink your water with trembling and anxiety. The original Quaker right here in verse 18. And say to the people of the land, thus says the Lord God to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the land of Israel, they shall eat their bread with anxiety and drink their water with dread so that their land may be emptied of all who are in it because of the violence of all those who dwell in it. And then the cities that are inhabited shall be laid waste, and the land shall become desolate, and you shall know that I am the Lord. How many times tonight have we seen that repeated? Over and over and over again. Why is it that we are so dense until God begins to judge that we finally say, Oh, is that you, Lord? Why do we wait until that extreme moment in our life? But again, speaking of the desperate conditions, man, they're going to eat their bread with anxiety, drink their water with dread. It's going to be a bad day in Jerusalem. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, as we begin to wrap up tonight, verse 22, Son of man, what is this proverb that your people have about the land of Israel? which says the days are prolonged and every vision fails. Now tell them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will lay this proverb to rest, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are at hand and the fulfillment of every vision. For no more shall there be any false vision or flattering divination within the house of Israel. Remember, that was a problem. There were these prophets that were lying to the people saying, Oh, Babylon's not going to conquer. Go ahead and settle down. Go ahead and fight. Go ahead and resist because we're not going to, to war. We're not going to be taken away prisoner. For I am the Lord, verse 25. I speak and the word which I speak will come to pass. It will no more be postponed for in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and perform it says the Lord God. It would seem that the people had a proverb back there in verse 22 that was something along the lines of, yeah, yeah, we've heard it before, we've heard it before. You know, it's the same old trip, it's the same old story, oh yeah. God is coming and boy is he mad. It isn't much unlike what Peter talks about over in his first epistle 
where he says how in the last days there will be these scoffers that will say, where's the promise of his coming? Since our fathers have fallen asleep, all things have continued, just as from the beginning. Listen, folks. God is going to say as we close here tonight, verse 26, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, look, the house of Israel is saying the vision that he sees is for many days from now, and he prophesies of times far off. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God, None of my words will be postponed anymore, but the word which I speak will be done, says the Lord God. No more of this, oh, yeah, we've heard it all before. Oh, where is the promise of his coming? He's been saying this for a long time. And God is saying, I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. Let God be found true and every man a liar. His word will come to pass. And I got to tell you, folks, that one of the things that excites my heart that we may be seeing Jesus come at any time is the fact that more and more people are like, yeah, yeah, we've heard that before. You know, now that the 80s have come and gone and Jesus didn't return, there was this guy that wrote 88 Reasons Why Jesus Would Return in 1988. If you've been born again that long, you remember that book. Now it's interesting. I just got an email today. A guy has written a book that talks about a very prominent preacher in Southern California who leads a movement of churches as being maybe a figurehead, a personality that will usher in the Antichrist. And so there's a whole new buzz, there's a whole new interest, there's a whole new excitement about, ooh, ooh, ooh. But as long as people keep saying, ah, we've been hearing that stuff for a long time now, that fills my heart with excitement. Because Jesus told us that he would come like a thief in the night when we least expect him. You see, when the attitude is such that we're not expecting him, that could be the very time that he comes. His word is true. It will come to pass. Jesus is coming soon. Will you stand with me as we pray?